Welcome to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco, bringing you interviews with industry experts and regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land your job interviews in 60 days, guaranteed. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Guys, I am delighted to welcome my next guest, Jason Alba. Jason created JibberJobber.com, which is an amazing app that helps people to manage and organize their job search back in 2006. He is the author of three books and has spoken to job clubs across the U.S. So, Jason, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like, you know, here we're in the first week of 2018. It's a perfect time for people to hit the ground running on their job search. So, again, welcome and thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, Virginia. Thanks for having me on your show. So I did a really, you know, quick couple sentence intro, but I'd love to know a little bit about what you do and how you came to be in this position. So as you mentioned, I created a website or an app called Jibber Jobber, which is a replacement for the job search spreadsheet. It's basically an app okay. to help you stay organized and managed in your job search. And I came up with the idea back in 2006, so a long time ago, 12 years ago, and I was in my own job search and I was probably the worst job seeker in the world because I couldn't (laughs) get any interviews and I finally got an interview and I thought it went well, but the hiring manager didn't. So, I mean, it was long and depressing and unforeseen time in my life. And I stood back, I stepped back from the job search and just kind of analyze the process. Like, what was I doing? What should I have been doing? I read a lot of articles and was trying to really understand what the whole job search thing was all about. And I learned a lot and I figured out some things that I was doing wrong. I didn't figure out the thing that I was doing the most wrong until a little while later. But one thing that kept popping up was everybody, all the career professionals were saying, organize your job search and be organized and stay organized. And, you know, for example, if a recruiter calls you and asks you if you're still interested in a certain position and you don't remember, you don't know what they're talking about because you're not organized, it sounds like you're disinterested and you're not as interested as the person that they just talked to who was really interested in it. And so I thought, okay, well, great. Everybody's talking about organizing, but what are the tools? And at the time it was you know, a spiral notebook or sticky notes or like sticky Excel. Note. I was going to say sticky notes on your computer. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've gone to job clubs and people are writing things on their hands, like, you know, in fourth grade, you know, and, and I thought there has got to be a better way. And of course, technology's progressed a lot in the last 12 years, but 12 years yeah. ago, what we set out to do was come up with a tool that was really cool and sophisticated, but also easy to use. And it's taken quite a while to, you know, achieve all of those things. We launched in two months back in 06, and we've been developing ever since. And so that's kind of the background. I was say, of how it's, I it's, you've, re- you've made a, quite a bit of improvement from back then. I mean, I keep up with it, and it's an incredible tool. Yeah, I mean, I have a full-time staff of, I have three full-time developers and full-time QA person, and they're busy all the time. And so it's been interesting to evolve Jibber Jobber as a product because it's made me think about how we have to evolve in our own careers. You know, like if we stay where we were at 12 years ago, I mean, honestly, 12 years ago, Jibber Jobber was technically proficient. Like it it was good enough to help you organize and manage the job search. But the problem is over the last 12 years, our users have come to expect a different way that software looks Mm -hmm. and a different way that software acts. And so I've written a few blog posts over the years saying, you know, we changed our dress. Like Jibber Jobber is still the same thing at its core but we change the way it looks, whether it has to do with colors or fonts or, you know, whatever. And it's interesting as we compare that to ourselves as professionals, you know, I mean, I I know people, for example, an accountant who does the same thing they did 12 years ago and, and 20 and 30 years ago. But what is it that we can do with and for and to ourselves professionally to make us look like we're not, you know, a professional that hasn't changed in 12 yeah. years. Isn't that an interesting concept? Yeah, that is. I mean, it's like wearing the same wardrobe you wore 12 years ago and not changing, not improving on how you do all of your different responsibilities. Yeah. And the argument is, well, I could still do the job. So get off my back. But the reality is, 
the hiring managers and the recruiters are looking really at the face value as well as can you do your job, you know? And so yeah. I, I don't know, it's just, it's just a big le- lesson I've learned as a business just- owner that we need to make sure that we are staying up with, I hate to say looks and appearances because I feel like that's yeah, so but superficial, you, you but, but there's something there. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. So in addition to this, to the tool, you also share advice to job seekers and you speak to groups on this topic, correct? Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, (laughs) I I didn't set out to be any kind of job search expert. I was just kind of a software guy who was interested in making a tool to help people like me. But what I found was that I got to the point where I kept my team really busy. I didn't have anything to communicate with them. I wrote all the articles I could ever imagine and submitted them anywhere I could imagine. And then I just had a bunch of time on my hands, you know, just waiting for my developers to finish or waiting for that next cycle when I could submit an article. And I mean, long story short, I wrote a book and it was the first book that most people recognize on and about LinkedIn. There was actually a guy who wrote a book. It came out like a few days earlier than me. We were on the same email listserv and he knew I was writing my book and he knew my deadline. So I think he was pushing (laughs) his out to be the first one. But I wrote the first one that a lot of people had ever recognized. And I had no idea at the time what was going to happen because of that. But what happened was I was perceived as an expert, which is funny because I was not really the person that should have written the book. I could have named you at least six people that should have written that book, but they just didn't. They were too busy consulting on LinkedIn. So I wrote this book. I became the quote unquote expert. And then I started getting phone calls saying, we need you to speak at our conference. And how much do you charge? And I found out that professional speaking is crazy lucrative. I mean, it's just a crazy career field, which can be a lot of fun, definitely has pros and cons and stuff. But because of my book, and then I wrote two other books, and then I was just speaking a lot. Anytime I got asked to speak at a place, I would call up and look for job clubs around that area. And, you know, so I'd land in a city and I would speak for three days. You know, I'd do my paid speaking gig. And then I'd fit in as many free job club speaking gigs as I could. And it was exhausting, but it was a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. So being like getting, losing that job was probably the best thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> it Opening was a new door. I mean, there was definitely doors that were opened. I don't, you know, it's interesting because it sure didn't feel like the best thing that ever happened I'll to bet, me. Yeah, time. yeah. And the doors well, felt like they were locked and I had the Jimmy rig them, you know, I mean, it was, it was <laughs> not like, you know, all this wonderfulness just landed in my lap. This is over a yeah, long period no. of time. I, I blew through my 401k. I mean, that's part of how I funded the company. So, you know, with, with all this stuff that sounds really successful, there's definitely been some very difficult times sure. to get to the point to where I'm at now. Gosh, well, your book is I'm on LinkedIn now. What isn't that what it's called? It is. It's in the, the fourth book, edition, yeah. but I don't, I, yeah, I can't I recommend just, it because it's like two years old. So it's a little dated. Okay, but that was a great, yeah, I, I read that back when in the day. No, that was a great book. Uh, well, so since you, you're on the front line seeing people struggling to find a job, what are two major challenges that are facing people that are testing the job search waters, you know, or, or looking to make a career pivot? Hmm. You know, just off the top of my head, there's a lot of different challenges that people face and maybe different industries or whatever have different problems. The two things that I come across the most are probably age discrimination. And when I do presentations, that is the number one question that comes up always at every presentation. It, It just blows my mind that that is, I mean, we are united in trying to figure out age discrimination. And this is not just being an issue of being an old person, right? And old by like, I don't know, people that are too young as well. Yeah, Yeah. there are people that are too young. I mean, I actually, when I started my job search, I think I was about 32. And I was too old to be that entry level, you know, easily get into a job. And then I was too young to, you know, get a job with the titles that I had had before. And so it's just so weird to face age discrimination and deal with it. The other thing that is on my mind, because I'm actually writing my fourth book, I haven't really told him oh. that, but I'm working on my fourth book right now. And I'm really excited about it. But I was just talking about in my book, a story about when I was did a presentation in California and Dick Bull's the author of What Color Is Your Parachute? Parachute. He's mm-hmm. like the godfather of all things job search and career related and stuff like that. And so anyways, we were at lunch and he had come to my presentation, which was kind of intimidating to have him listen. Gosh. And, and he, he's yeah. a, he was a brilliant, brilliant person. He was genius level. And when we went to lunch, he was in his mid 80s and we were chatting and he said, Jason, your presentation or your message 
and my message are the same. And at the time, I was like, well, what does that mean to you? Because I don't even know what my message is. I just talked for two hours, and I shared tons of things. What is the message that you got out of it? And he said, our message is a message of hope. He said, when you show people that they have options, and options means more places to apply, you know, different companies than you ever thought of, different tactics than they're using now that don't seem to be working, you know, whatever. When you show people that they have options, you give them hope. And it was really profound because in my job search in 2006, I had lost hope. I was depressed and I was at a point where, you know, it was kind of drudgery. I'd get up every morning and I'd make myself do some job search things. And it got to a point where I didn't have any options because I didn't know of any other things or places or any of that stuff. And I had lost hope. And so I see that a lot in job seekers where they are, they're at a point where they're like, you know... I've tried everything. I've applied everywhere. Things aren't working. I keep getting stuck in these certain places. And you know what? Why am I really trying this hard? Because I've already worked for however long. And why? I mean, it's the rat race. And I'm not really anxious to get back into the rat race. I was just talking to a friend of mine who just left senior management role. And he's going to be an Uber driver because he's just sick and tired of the rat race and the politics and all the stuff that come in corporate America. And he just needs to chill for a bit, you know? And I see that yeah. in today's world where we have a lot of people who are just really tired. I'll tell you what, something really interesting. Before my third book came out, which was 51 Alternatives to a Real Job. And so this was just an idea of, hey, you know what? Here are 51 different ideas how you can create revenue. And they might not, you know, not any single one might make you enough money to replace what you need to make. But if you put two or three or four of them together, maybe you can create enough revenue streams where you don't have to have a quarter. Side hustle. Yeah, yeah. And if you do enough okay. side hustles, then that's all you do. And you maybe could be very happy with that if you're if you're disgruntled with the corporate world. And so I would go do my presentations on Jibber Jobber and LinkedIn and what I call Career Management 2.0, which is one of my favorite presentations. And I would mention this book just in passing. And when I was done with my presentation, I'd have a line of people that wanted to, you know, say hi or whatever. And almost every single one of them asked, when is that book coming out? Even though I talked about LinkedIn or, you know, career stuff or networking or branding or jibber jobber or whatever, everybody was interested in something that they could do to help them create another revenue stream or other revenue streams and just kind of, I guess, not depend 100% on an employer, right? I'm not surprised by that response because you drive your own business then. You control it. So when I started Jibber Jobber, my goal was to still get a job. I mean, I had this big, long career plan where I was going to be a CIO and I had various goals and stuff like that. And when I started Jibber Jobber, I thought, I want something that will make a hundred bucks a month. Because if I ever get laid off again, that employer, that boss might be able to take away most of my income but they'll never be able to take away all of my income. And if I have something that's making me a hundred bucks a month on the side, then I will have some sense of an empowerment that I didn't have when I got laid off with no side hustle. Yeah. So you don't feel like you, it gives you hope. It keeps hope uh, alive. Hope and, and a little bit of power and some dignity. Power. I mean, there, mm-hmm. there's a whole lot of that's reasons to have something where you're creating a revenue stream on the side. Nice. No. And it's, it's a little safety net. It makes you take, I think it helps take away the victim mentality too, because it's untouchable. God yeah. knowing. I don't know about if they're all recession proof. That's what I always worry about, but no, that's a good point. So let me ask you this. You know, we talked about age discrimination. We talked about people losing hope. Is there something that you find that people, when they do jump into the job search, it just sort of catches them by surprise. It's, you know, they're catching them off guard and maybe it's those two things, but maybe it's something else. A lot of what I hear about from people who reach out to me is that they're just surprised at how different the job search is today. I mean, some people, I mean, when I lost my job 12 years ago, I thought my first thought was I need to go find a newspaper and look at the help (laughs) wanted because in my brain, that's what I had been taught as far as how you find a job, right? And so I get emails from people today who've said, you know, I've worked in industry for 10 or 20 or 30 years. This is my first time doing a real job search, and I don't even know what to do, you know, because you don't go get a newspaper and look for the opening, especially if you've been in industry for 30 years and you're used to making 100000 you know, give or take 30000 mm-hmm. you, you don't know how to replace that. And 
the job search of today is just, it's different than it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. So I think that's shocking for a lot of people. For the younger crowd, for the millennials, you know, millennials get really beat up in the press and everywhere, like on LinkedIn and articles and and in Facebook and everybody loves bashing on millennials. Yeah. And I think some of it is definitely merited. I mean, I know plenty of millennials and I've seen some of these attitudes and you know, work ethic issues and flightiness and stuff like that. But the problem is for the younger crowd, whether they're millennials or not, they inherit a lot of this bad branding from or about the millennials. And so somebody who might have a great work ethic and all the stuff that's like, if you will, anti-millennial, but they walk into an interview or they walk into a networking situation, their biggest task seems to be having to fight against all of these stereotypes that they've inherited. And so, I mean, it kind of goes back to age discrimination. I was going to say it's generation discrimination. Exactly. And there's so many, I was just watching a talk yesterday on cracking the product management interview by somebody at Google. And she talked about the isms, you know, ageism and racism. And there are so many isms that we have to kind of figure out, you know, I mean, some of the things are absolutely true with the stereotypes, but there's other things, especially when you're in a job search, there's other things that you need to kind of raise your hand and say, wait a minute. (laughs) I mean, I know you've stereotyped me because of my age and how I look and all these other things, but let me help you understand that I'm not those stereotypes. That's not me. And I can actually do this job really well, you know? Yeah. Interesting. And I don't know why this generation is every generation has its pros and its cons, but this one, I don't know if it's because they're bigger than Gen X and Gen Y. And so they're getting so much more attention. I mean, baby boomers got tons of attention. So maybe it's just the sheer size that makes the label them. But it's, yeah, it's tough I, because I, I not everyone's a stereotype. Yeah. To, well, see, and that, that's the big argument about any stereotype is you know, please don't judge me based on my, you know, gender, race, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we're human and humans judge. And I mean, that's, that's yeah, what we do. Yeah. We categorize. And we categorize. And we categorize yep. My take on the why is, you know, really, if you go back and look at the baby boomers and the Gen Xers and every generation has had, you know, when they get to that 17 to 25 year old phase, they're like, oh, my gosh, there's that whiny bratty, entitled (laughs) gender. I mean, it's not like this is unique to the millennials, right? It's just that millennials, I think, started to get a lot of, I want to say press, but that includes all the social media. So back in the olden days, it's not like, you know, you were sitting on your phone reading all these articles about how bad the baby boomer kids were, you know? Yeah, yeah. But nowadays, you can't not read it. It's all over the place. And everybody's talking about these entitled whiny babies And meanwhile, they're kind of like, hey, wait, what's going on here? I mean, I honestly think they're very similar to how the baby boomers were and the Gen Xers were at those ages. Uh, Um, You know, I would not want to read about my my 26-year-old self as a Gen Xer. I'm glad no one was, was spamming that all over the place. Yeah, stereotyping is nasty. I think it's one of those things that comes at you, is side blinds you from or blindsides you when you're in your job search. Because especially if you've come out of industry and and you've had a job and you were competent and you had some respect and maybe you had some people reporting to you or whatever, but you had accomplishments and then all of a sudden you get thrown into this cattle, you know, this this pool of Mm -hmm. other job seekers and there's nothing distinguishing about you and they've already judged you based on your age or whatever. I mean, that is really well, it, shocking. As a it job. just shows you that really no one is immune, you know, because you're right. I deal with more people that are older Gen Xers and baby boomers who worry about age discrimination. But to your point, the younger groups are feeling it just as well because they've got this label that's so prominent across social media right now. Yeah. So to shift gears a little bit, what, I think I know what you're going to say, but what, is there a piece of advice that you can give someone thinking about, <laughs> about making a career move? What would be sort of the first thing you tell them? Are you talking about like changing careers or just, you know, getting their next gig? Getting their next gig. I'll share something that I've seen a lot of, a mistake that I've seen a lot of people make, including myself. Oh. So okay. when I was, my last role, I was called general manager. I was the, really the president of this little software company, but they told me I was too young to be a president, so they wouldn't <laughs> give me that title. They made me a general manager. <laughs> a bunch of idiots, seriously. So anyways, I'm the general manager, and I thought about that. I thought it was very interesting being a general manager 
general. What does that mean? That's such a, I know, it's, it's such a bad, such a bad a title in this era of it's specialists. It's really a dumb yeah. title. And so yeah. when I started my job search, I knew that I wanted to go get back on the path that I had designed for myself. And so a good logical next step to get a few years of experience in this area would have been project manager or business analyst. And really, mm-hmm. I was a product manager, but I didn't I had never even heard of that title at the time. So what I started to do, I identified what I wanted to be. But I was still hung up on, I can do that. You know, have you ever done PL? Yep, I had PL responsibility. Sales? Yep, a little bit of sales. Oh, development? Yep, uh, development. You know what? Put me anywhere and I'll excel, right? And so I right. was kind of, I was showing myself as a jack of all trades. And what I found was nobody wanted a jack of all trades. Nobody really wanted a general manager unless you had like 20 or 30 years of experience. Unless you were, yeah, ready to be a president. General right. manager. Yeah. So what they wanted was a very specific role. And when you portray yourself as I can do multiple things, so just put me there and I'll excel, it doesn't fly. People really want someone who can say, I am really good at this particular silo and let me show you, you know, with stories and examples and portfolio and let me explain to you how great I am at this particular title, right? And so I think that's one of the biggest issues that job seekers need to figure out early on. I mean, and you know what? I've heard this for like, if you go to a business seminar or small business seminar, one of the things they talk about is you need to define your niche. And it's hard because when you want to sell something, you're like, well, I could sell something to that person and that person and those people in this group in that category. I mean, everybody should buy my stuff. And what the business marketing experts say is figure out what your niche is and then go after that niche and help that niche understand Mm -hmm. how you are customized and the right solution for them because everybody feels special right? I mean, I don't want to buy something that a 90-year-old is going to buy because I'm in, the, I'm in a different stage of life or a three-year-old, right? I want something for my group and for me. And so job seekers, it's hard for business owners to do that. It's hard for job seekers to do that. But once you identify your niche and you can really narrow your marketing messaging on that niche, I think you can make a lot of progress that you otherwise aren't going to see. That's a really good point. And I know people feel like, oh, well, if they present themselves as a specialist, they'll narrow their options. Yeah. I go back to think about a, a hiring manager is looking for someone to solve a pain. And no one's pain is, I need someone who can do a little bit of everything. Usually it's a very specific pain. But then once they bring you on for that specialist role, then you know they love for you to be a generalist. But Absolutely. they don't know that they need that at that point. So, that's See, really- and, and that's the issue is some of the job seekers are like, well, let me just educate them. And no, that's not the issue. Your job is to make a sale. You have to sell yourself. And so figure out what your customer wants. Figure out how you can you know, create a product, which is yourself. Package your product, I should say, so that they can understand that you are the right person for the job. And then once you get the job, like you said, go ahead and backfill all of those other things and show them how great you really are. But if you want to get that job, you got to sell yourself as the right person for that job. Yeah. Yeah. You got to connect the dots for them because no one's going to take the time to try to figure it out. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So when someone comes to you, and I'm sure you get these all the time, people that are engaged in a job hunt, they are not having luck. Where do you recommend they start in terms of trying to figure out where things are breaking down? Yeah, that's a good question because in my job search, I was, I told you I had a main problem and that your question leads right into what my main problem was. I had a problem, but I didn't understand it was a very specific and solvable problem. All I knew was I wasn't getting anywhere and nothing was working and the job search process is broken and people are dumb, and I'm worthless, right? (laughs) Like I was looking at a very macro level, looking at the results, whereas I didn't have enough maturity or maybe sanity at the time because I was so clouded in my depression. I didn't have enough ability to look at the very specific areas that I was not making progress, right? So here was my problem. I wasn't getting interviews. I kind of forced my way into one interview because I was obnoxious about it. And like I said, I thought (laughs) it went well. It actually did go well, but I just didn't get a yes answer. Right. Well, you need a lot of interviews to get the yeses. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so my problem was I wasn't getting any interviews. And what I should have thought was, you know, well, what leads to interviews? 
Is it applications? Is it networking? Is it, you know, what, what are the specific things? Well, I realized this is Monday morning quarterback. Okay. So I finally got to the point, I was sitting down with a professional, well, a volunteer professional resume writer, and we were going over my resume and I understood that my resume was a complete mismatch for the titles that I was applying to. And so remember, I told you I was general manager. Well, before that, I was a uh, VP of IT at the same company. It was a really small company. So I kind of gave myself all the cool titles I had ever wanted. I was CIO. Before that, I was an IT manager. And then before that, I was a developer. And I was applying for business analyst and project manager and eventually product manager. But people were looking at this resume from a general manager executive because I had two other executive roles on my resume. They're saying, well, you know, why does a CIO want to be a business analyst? This doesn't make sense. Delete, right? And so we need to have real understanding and clarity. Well, first of all, the big message is figure out where you're failing because maybe you're getting a lot of interviews, but you're just not getting past the second interview, right? And so, so reverse that, engineer it. Exactly. Figure out where you're failing and then go back and figure out that very specific thing as opposed to just kind of throwing your hands up in the air and giving up and starting a business like I did. <laughs> <laughs> figure out what the problems really are and then go address those very specific problems. And I'll tell you what, I am honestly a big fan of getting professional help like yours because people like you, here's the deal. Resume writing and interview coaching and career coaching and job search coaching and counseling, they can sound expensive, you know, especially when you're in a job search and you don't have an income coming in, but you have expenses and it's scary to spend this money. But the reality is, you know, I went to friends and family and even people who were hiring managers, but they weren't actively hiring, you know, when I was asking them for help. And I got a lot of advice and stuff, but the advice I got was, it was disconnected, it was old, it was ineffective, and it really was misleading. I got a lot of, man, your resume looks great. You're going to get hired in no time. Nobody, a professional resume writer like yourself would have been able to look at my situation and my resume and what I was applying to and say, wait a minute, Jason, we got this backwards. Like, we're, you're doing something wrong. Let's fix it. All the advice I got from non-professionals was, oh, man, you've had a great career. You're going to do so awesome, right? Well, they weren't looking at my problem, which was how do I get my next job? They were looking at me as a professional and my life and kind of with kid gloves because your family's going to treat you a little bit with kid gloves, not always, but sometimes. And so anyways, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of finding somebody like you who has been in the trenches for a long time with lots of clients and have seen things that work and things that don't work, right? And really narrowing down on the problem and fixing that like a tactical problem. Yeah, no, I agree. And there's professionals for everything. There's people that coach you through certain kind of interviews. There's people that coach you on creating, you know, elevator pitches. And it can't hurt to get the information, get some advice. It's free to get advice from those people. Because at least, and you or find someone that will give you the blunt, honest truth that is a friend or a family. I mean, it's harder to find, but at least get someone who's not afraid to tell you any unvarnished opinions. Yeah, well, and see, here's my argument. The thing is, I have friends who can be unvarnished and who will tell me something that looks like the cold hard truth, but they might be wrong because they have not worked with dozens or hundreds of job seekers over the years. And somebody like yourself, who's been in this world, the job search world, you've seen things from different industries and different levels of professions and different titles, and you've seen things that work and things that don't work. So you need to make sure that all of your marketing material, your resume, your LinkedIn profile, your pitches, your stories, anything that you would ever use anywhere in an interview or network setting or whatever, you need to make sure that's all aligned with what you're looking for, right? Forward, what you're shooting for, and not a brag sheet of what you've done in the past. And that was a huge lesson that I learned as a job seeker, which actually helped me in my own business because as a business owner who wants to sell something, I don't need to sell to you things that are in the past that are irrelevant. I need to sell things to you that will help you solve your problem. Does that make sense? That's, yeah, it does. 
I sort of think of it, this is your brochure. This is not your blueprint. No one wants to see every single thing you've ever done. It's much too oh, long. No. It's not interesting. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Thank you. What are, this, this is my last sort of, I guess, big career question, and then I want to know what's going on next for you. One or two tools that you feel like someone absolutely cannot be without as they embark on a job hunt? Tools that you cannot be without. So, man, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with LinkedIn. <laughs> they, they've never really Same. liked me because I, you know, I have been very critical about decisions and strategies that they've done. I mean, as a business, they've done fantastic. I mean, what yeah. a $27 billion exit. Give me a break. That's awesome. But I've been on the user and user advocacy side for a long time, and there's a lot of complaints and there's a lot of issues, and they don't seem to listen to us, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is they're the 8,000 pound gorilla. And it's a necessary evil. You have to figure out what LinkedIn is and how to incorporate it into your job search strategy and really your long-term career management strategy. And so what that means is there's two, when I do my webinars, I actually have two webinars on Jibber Jobber that explain this. One is on what I call a proactive strategy, which is how do I use LinkedIn proactively to find people and reach out to them and how do I use groups, et cetera, et cetera. And then just because the opposite of proactive is reactive, mm -hmm. I kind of call the other one reactive, which is really just coming up with a good LinkedIn profile. And I spend, I don't know, an hour and a half or two hours walking you through the profile and things that I recommend on how to create a better profile that'll be read and that'll be found in search engines, et cetera, et cetera. You need to figure out LinkedIn. As I do anything that has to do with networking and career, there is no replacement for LinkedIn. There just isn't. I mean, hiring managers and recruiters, they go there to look for you and to research you. When you're on an interview or you're going to meet with somebody, where do you go? You go to LinkedIn to learn about them, right. right? So LinkedIn, you know, I'm excited to see what comes out in the next five or 10 years that might, you know, uh, replace But do you see anything, anything, that, anything no. that might be able to take? I don't either. No, I so so I read this really interesting question on Quora about, you know, what will be the death of LinkedIn? And I think it was somebody who actually used to work at LinkedIn who said the death of LinkedIn will be what is it? It won't be one competitor, it will be a thousand paper cuts being for example, if you are a recruiter who's looking for developers, you don't really go to LinkedIn because developers are not going to LinkedIn and fleshing out their profiles and bragging about what they do. And I mean, it's just not the place where developers go do that, but they'll go to a site called Stack Overflow, right. which is a fantastic and amazing resource for anybody who's a developer. And beyond just having you know, profiles, which they have kind of wimpy profiles compared to what you'll see on LinkedIn, because that's not the purpose of Stack Overflow. They give developers a place to go and ask questions, like technical questions, and answer each other's questions. And so a lot of developers that I've known over the years, they like problems. They like solving problems. They like being the person who can, you know, fix a math problem or a whatever problem. And so Stack Overflow has been this place where you can actually go and show your stuff, right? And so where do technical recruiters go? They don't spend as much time on LinkedIn as they'll spend on Stack Overflow because on Stack Overflow, you can find people who don't just say they know about Java or C Sharp or whatever, but they're actually answering questions about it, right? And so you they can actually, it. it's like the first phase of the interview, right? So Will there be that for, you know, finance professionals and product managers, et cetera, et cetera? It really is. The death of LinkedIn could be, and I don't think LinkedIn will ever die, not like MySpace and stuff like that. But I think that anybody that's nudging into LinkedIn space is going to be very niche oriented. And so the question yeah. is, whatever your niche is, can you find some environment where your peers are and where they're communicating because that's, I think that would be a really good place to go network, et cetera, et cetera. It's, and LinkedIn has become, you know, we talked about, you know, for you and a small company developing your niche, LinkedIn has not become that niche. And, and they kind of were on the path to have, you know, with groups and some other tools, they were kind of going that direction where you could say, well, I'm this kind of professional, so I'm going to find my certain corner in LinkedIn. 
but you know they're just too general for that. So anyways, LinkedIn is the tool that I definitely recommend. I mean, really everybody recommends it. You can't get away from that recommendation. I want to recommend Jibber Jobber, but I'm yeah. not sure. I, I was I don't going know. to if you didn't. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's awesome, but it's my baby, right? So I like I'm I'm totally. It could be an ugly baby, but I still think well, it's beautiful. And you have a free version. I mean, you've got options for everyone. They can start with the free, and then yeah, you know, based on what so, they need, they can they can add more. So what we did was, like I said, I've learned a lot in 12 years. We used to have three levels and then the highest level had like 40 things in the premium version. We changed it to two levels and then now there's only like four or five things in the premium version. And we cut the price down to 60 bucks a year and threw in my entire video library. And so it it became a no-brainer to upgrade. But if you can't do 60 bucks a year, the free version is really quite powerful. Like I said, With only four things in the premium version, we moved a lot of the other previously premium features onto the free side. And so, yeah, it's definitely cool. And I recommend it, but... Well, it's so much easier than a spreadsheet. Let me ask you this, because I haven't been on there in a while. Is it mobile-friendly now? Well, yes. Not only is it mobile-friendly, but we have mobile apps. So there's apps specifically for the mobile, whether it's Android or iOS. Okay. All right. Well, second to last question. A lot of people, you know, we, you talked about people lining up to hear about all these ways to make additional money or, you know, the side hustle. When, when someone is really interested in that, how do you feel like they should get started? Because I know how I started mine. You know how you started yours. But what do you tell people in terms of, you know, putting that first toe in? So I was talking to a recruiter friend of mine yesterday, and I really respect this guy. He's really sharp, has some very unique skills that I haven't seen in other recruiters. He's a techie, and he loves poking around with technology and stuff. But I know that he's really good at what he does, and he's very strategic thinking and visionary. Anyways, he was telling me that, you know, maybe I should become a consultant and do more HR level stuff and not just recruiting. And my answer was, well, I mean, he's working right now. I said, why don't you do that on the side while you have a paycheck, right? And so one of the things that I've learned is that starting your business or your side hustle or whatever is expensive and it's hard and it takes longer to monetize than you might expect. For example, if I'm consulting and I make, say, $300 an hour, I might look at that and say, man, I make so much money per hour. I only have to work like one and a half hours a day and then I don't have to do anything. Well, the question is, what's it going to take for you to consistently get an hour and a half billing time every day, right? And it might take you 12 hours a day to find your one and a half billable hours every day. And so my thing is, what's the path to getting to a point where this new side hustle or this new revenue stream or this new business is going to create the kind of money that you need it to create? And for what I didn't understand when I started Jibber Jobber, because Jibber Jobber was a product. It was not a like a consultant service. service. Yeah. And yeah. so I had people who started consulting services around the same time I started Jibber Jobber. And within two months, they were making great money, right? Because they had figured out how to sell their services and they got to bill right away. And it took me like four months before my first person upgraded for, at the time, it was 10 bucks a month. So after four months, I finally made $10. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's so tough. I guess you it, know? So it, and it depends on what your revenue generation is. For me, there's no expense. I already had a computer. I already had an internet and a phone. Yeah. I needed the confidence. So for me, my first step was do them for free. Build up enough people that can speak to you and serve as references and then start charging. Yep. So I guess it was yeah. a lot of free work for a while there, but I felt but, like I had nothing worked, to lose. Right? Yeah. yeah. You, you yeah. had no investment. I had a friend who was looking at $500,000 loan to buy some equipment to hopefully start a business that might work out, you know? And it's like, oh, man, if that broke. doesn't work yeah. out, yeah. wow, you oh, got a yeah. law on yeah. the line. So, yeah. you know, I mean, is it going to be a side hustle thing that's going to create, quote unquote, money while you sleep, which is like everybody's dream, but dream. Yeah. It, it, it's actually harder to do than it sounds, you know? Are you going to go out and flip houses? And then there's all kinds of issues with, you know, I mean, everything is going to have a certain level of hard What I've learned is that no matter what you do in a year or in 10 years, you'll be somewhere, right? So what can you do now 
to strengthen your what I call career management, and a part of career management is multiple revenue streams. That might mean that you just be better at what you do and just stay really employable and understand how job search works because you're probably going to get laid off every two to five years. So if you're okay with that and you can take that risk, then that's fine. But is there any way that you can create a revenue stream that can, you know, like I said earlier, can be $100 a month or a couple thousand dollars a month? Yeah, cushion the blow. Yeah, because you're right. It's not a matter of if you're going to get laid off, it's when. We all get laid off. Yeah. So, no, I agree with you. All right. Well, in closing, and you alluded to this at the beginning, so I hope you'll share. Tell me what's next or tell us what's next for you. Maybe you can talk about this book you're working on. Well, I'm always focusing on, before the book, I'm always focusing on improving Jibber Jobber. And so I have a mm-hmm. full-time team. And we are, you know, before I did a lot of shotgun stuff where it's like try all these things, all these things out. And now we're extremely focused on where we spend our development time. And so over the next, you know, six to 12 months, I hope that we come out with more amazingness in Jibber Jobber. And that's really my focus. I mean, that's a really vague definition. I don't have more amazingness written anywhere, but... (laughs) But that encapsulates a lot of the stuff you have written. This book, you know, after my first book, I swore I'd never write another book. And then circumstances led to me writing a second one with a co-author. And then I wrote a third one. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I can't do this anymore. You know, it takes a ton of time. But yeah. after doing Jibber Jobber for 12 years and speaking a lot and talking with people and listening to my users and people at the job clubs, I've just learned a lot. And so I'm putting down a lot of the things that I've learned over the last 12 years of journey for job seekers. And and I'm really excited about it because these are things that, you know, they come from my heart. They come from my experience. They come from me testing them out on stage and then following up with people. They come from stories of people across the country and really the world of things that work. And my whole message, I mean, Dick says that my message was hope and giving people hope. What I've always thought my message was, was helping you understand that it's time to take control of your career. And I said before, career management. Career management is my message. I want our world to be less reactive when we're job seekers and be ready for that. You know, be ready for the changes in our careers and the changes in industry and the world and the economy and all that stuff. I want us to proactively manage our careers. And, you know, in the olden days, that meant, you know, doing what people said before was get a degree, learn another language, you know, all these little tidbits of things that supposedly would give you job security quote unquote, mm-hmm. throughout your life. And instead of relying on job security, which is kind of like packaging this thing up and hoping that it's going to be awesome in the end, I want to proactively manage my career. And so that's really my message. And so I share a lot of ideas in this fourth book on it's just stuff that I've learned from experts and practitioners and job seekers and experiences and stuff like that. I, I'm really excited about it. Oh, that's so ideas grounded in true stories, in fact. Exactly. Yeah. I, that's great. I know I can relate when I read something, when I read about someone's story and their challenge and I, get, I say, okay, well, that happened to me or that, that's how I'm feeling. And it, it really resonates that way. Oh, I can't wait. To, do you have a title yet or still working on it? <laughs> Yeah, the title is definitely going to change. Right now, it's 101 Hacks in the Job Search or something like that. Okay. The last time I tried to do 101 book, it came out to be 51. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so maybe don't put a number on it just yet. <laughs> some of the alternative titles I've thought about were like, you know, Lessons from a 12-Year Job Search and, you know, so, something along those lines because it has, okay. this book really has been 12 years in the making. I didn't realize it, but it has been. Wow. Well, hopefully you've done a lot of recordings and then you can just do voice to tech recognition to get some of the stuff on paper. Save you some time. Well, I appreciate that. Hopefully (laughs) it'll be an awesome book. Well, Jason, thank you so much. If anyone wants to learn more about Jibber Jobber and tools for taking control of your career, the website is www.jibberjobber.com. I will post this bio on my website. Again, Jason, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this. I appreciate it. You've given us so many reasons to hope. Well, thank you, Virginia. It's my pleasure. Thanks for... You've been listening to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's skim online readers, hiring and decision makers, go to www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.